We may as well go ahead and get started then. There are not a lot of people here. Can I assume that everybody here already knows what this project is, or are there total newcomers? There's one to there are a couple of total newcomers. Okay, then I'm going to go over the bit with what the project is, and then we will talk about a couple other things. But yeah, with this few people here, I'm going to blame that completely on where we are in the convention center. Um, it's a good opportunity to actually do this a little bit more interactively and hear about the things that y'all are concerned about, and then hopefully we'll be able to talk about some of that in more detail. If you don't already know who I am, I'm Flynn. I'm a tech evangelist at Buoyant these days. I'm also the original author of Emissary and still the longest serving maintainer. Uh, we can talk a bit about the purpose of the project for those who are new, the past, the present, the future. And the purpose, the very first thing you run into in Cloud Native is if you have a cluster, you will then have people outside the cluster who want to use things inside the cluster. This is not allowed. By default, this is one of the things that clusters try to prevent for security reasons. So we need something to deal with that. This is collectively called the ingress problem, as distinct from the ingress resource or ingress controllers because ingress is totally not an overloaded term in Kubernetes. We need something that sits there on the edge of the cluster that can mediate access for these people coming in, trying to use workloads inside the cluster, and that is the problem that Emissary was created to solve. It is an ingress controller. Although you can configure it with the ingress resource, we do not recommend that. Technically speaking, this function that we're talking about here is basic routing. Emissary can do a lot more than that. For example, it could decide that these users are actually not allowed to talk to workload B. That's a basic authorization and authentication function. Emissary doesn't really separate those two. The way it does it, you can use it for either or both. We can do things like traffic splitting, where we can send traffic between two different versions of a workload and thereby do A-B testing or canaries. Uh, we can do retries, where if a given request fails, we'll just keep doing it until it succeeds. We can do rate limiting and circuit breaking and a bunch of other stuff that doesn't fit easily on slides, so I didn't try to put them there. The fact that Emissary gets to do all this shifts it from being just an English controller into being an API gateway. Emissary is a developer-centric, self-service, role-based, very opinionated API gateway that is a CNCF, CNCF incubating project. By developer-centric, I mean that the stuff you see in Emissary's input language is tailored to what an application developer is going to be likely to want to do. <clears throat> It is not specifically tailored for being something that an infrastructure engineer is going to find perfect for their needs. That was not the goal. It is self-service in the sense that, especially in smaller organizations, the app developers can do everything on their own. But in larger organizations, and this also gets into the role-based part, you can split this so that people who are worried more about cluster ops get to do things like listeners and hosts and rate limit services and all that stuff, leaving your developers free to talk about how do the requests get to my workloads in the first place. Uh, fun fact, this bit is actually the reason why Gateway API has the role-based concept. Finally, it is a very opinionated product. There are a very large number of things that could be really, really cool, but don't really fit the model that I just described because they are not something that a developer is likely to want. They are not something that's amenable to self-service. Those things are not in the input language. I am biased. I tend to believe that today, the Gateway API The, sorry, the API gateway, I knew I was going to do that at some point. The class of API gateways out there in the world today tend to be kind of functionally equivalent. They can all do the same sorts of things. The main differentiator tends to be how do you talk to them. And I keep hearing that the way you configure Emissary works better if you're a developer trying to do all this stuff 
without having it get in the way. Again, I am biased. Now, that's the quick overview of the project. Uh, we have a couple of options here. One is I can go ahead and talk about the past and the present and the future. The other one is y'all can start yelling out questions and we can see what y'all are really interested in. So, any takers? No? All right, we'll just continue on. Then. We're gonna talk a little bit about the past. Um, emissary is old. <laughs> emissary has been around since 2017. This is particularly fascinating because it means that emissary predates CRDs. Emissary showed up right at the time that third party resources were being deprecated, but before CRDs had been developed yet. Unfortunately, this has ramifications for some of the things in the emissary's history. For example, these two things before structural CRDs came around, it was fine. If you're not familiar with the whole structural CRD concept and nomenclature, one of the things it says is that a given field must have a single type. You can't do something that could be a string or could be a list of strings. Uh, we did this a lot. And the reason we did it a lot was that the part of emissary that is reading those CRDs at the time, and honestly, the part that's still processing them, was written in Python. And Python is perfectly comfortable with this. So there are places where you get things that could be either a list or a string, that you get things where there's at least one place where we had, you could have something that was either a Boolean or a string, uh, and they meant slightly different things. And this was not a sustainable thing. Um, when we did the V3 Alpha 1 CRDs, we had to fix all that. That was about the point that Kubernetes started enforcing the structural CID, CRD idea. And so all of those places where we had multiple types had to turn into a single type that was known ahead of time. That was the point where ambassador ID must be a list, you know, things like that. We, uh, in order to deal with people who were already running emissary and using V1 or V2 CRDs, and trying to come to the V3 Alpha 1 world, V3 Alpha 1 had breaking changes in it. The only way you can really do breaking changes in Kubernetes is via conversion webhooks. Nobody recommends using conversion webhooks. Even the API machinery people say, quote, they are oppressively difficult to write and to operate, end quote. Um, this makes things fascinating. But the end result for the project is that people, including me, don't like the conversion webhooks and want them to go away. This is hard. Um, the way Kubernetes does versioning is interesting. Only a single version of a resource can be stored at a given moment. If you have written something at v2 and then you try to read it by asking the Kubernetes API servers on its v3 alpha 1 endpoint for your resource, you will get the v2 resource just translated back into v3 alpha 1 by a conversion webhook. If there is no conversion webhook, uh, it pretty much just drops anything where the name is changed or you actually get an error if the type changes. It's, it's weird. It's very tricky. Another thing that we run into here is uh, we really shouldn't be using the get ambassador.io domain anymore for anything. And you'll notice in those CRDs I put up, the API version starts with get ambassador.io. The company ambassador, which is the one that pretty much funded the development of Emissary for the first many years of its life, is pulling away from this. We talked about this at great length in Paris. But the end result is that they own Git Ambassador.io and Emissary does not. So that's a little interesting, especially because changing that bit in the API version, we're now changing the API group. And everything I just said about conversion webhooks ceases to be a factor, which is a good thing, but it also means that it's not possible to do runtime conversion in any meaningful way. And we have to talk about migrations. 
This has been a really fun debate for the last several months, just as a point of interest. <laughs> and that brings us up to the present. <clears throat> the present. I talked, yeah, Paris, it was Paris, right? All the KubeCons are blurring together now. Um, I talked in Paris about the fact that, yeah, we had to go and become a community project again as opposed to effectively having corporate backing. That's what we've been working on for the last many moons. Um, it's going, which is kind of nice. So, you know, we have the emissary ingress.dev domain now. We actually have doc builds happening over there. So you can go there and see emissary docs, which Huge props to Nate from the CNCF and Phil, who's one of the new emissary maintainers. Um, and we have successfully gone and gotten unit tests working on the dev4.x branch, which is where emissary4 development is happening. So all of that is good. Um, we have basically sorted things out with Ambassador of the company. If none of you have gone through the process of switching from having corporate backing to needing to be a community thing, that line item was a lot more hours than I was expecting it to be. Um, and I should point out, Ambassador of the company is actually being very good about this, which is great. Uh, we also have new maintainers from the community. Mark, Phil, Alice is kind of a returning maintainer. She was not in a position to do any real work on Emissary for a long time, and now she is able to again, which is awesome. Um, one really interesting thing is, uh, if you're currently running Emissary version 3, you will be pulling images from a repo that is hosted by Ambassador the Company and paid for by Ambassador the Company. At some point, TM, we're also going to have to do something about that. Um, I think what the shape of that is, is that the images get pulled over and then re-pushed onto GHCR as GHCR packages. I'm still kind of trying to find something that's easier than that, but I'm not sure there is anything easier than that. So, you know, the end result is that we actually have made a lot of progress on the goals that we talked about in Paris of going ahead and, and becoming a community project again. Um, that's the good news. The less good news, like I said, it has been slow going. Uh, we have the doc site up but it's not completely active yet. There's stuff on it that, at a minimum, you know, needs some attention from graphic design and things like that. I found out yesterday, I think it was yesterday, I found out that there's a chunk of the quick start that doesn't render properly and makes it very difficult to follow. Um, Dev4.x has actually seen a lot of work and we've done some pretty cool things in there already. We're not quite ready to start shipping builds off of it, which is really personally kind of infuriating. So I'm making that a goal on my side for London. Um, the end-to-end -end tests running there are a big, fun thing we have to deal with. And we've pretty much decided that we are going to have to switch the API group, which um, is kind of fascinating. On the one hand, it means that you're talking about a migration instead of a conversion, like I said. On the other hand, it means that you can run that conversion offline, get a bunch of YAML that you can then look at, apply to your cluster, and it becomes really, really easy to run Emissary 3 next to Emissary 4 on the same cluster at the same time and make sure that everything is working before you turn Emissary 3 off, which was a huge concern when we were talking through all the other ways we could have done this. So, uh, sorry, not sorry, maybe. I mean, I, I, I feel bad, but I honestly believe that it's the best thing that we can do to move forward. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity, since we're already talking about that, we can go through and clean up a bunch of stuff, like we can get rid of all the underscores and you know things like that. It's the most... Honestly, that's the most obvious one. We can get away from having timeouts that have to be specified in milliseconds and let you use proper units, you know, things like that. Um, I'd like to personally apologize to everyone for the timeout underscore MS field. That is 100% my fault. I, really, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
So uh, another thing that's happened kind of under the hood, and I'm not going to lie, this has been a lot of fun for me personally, is going through and taking a chainsaw to a lot of the ambassador edge dot code that was still in there. It's uh, the, that's just fun. <laughs> what did you do today? I deleted 5,000 lines of code. Uh, so from the perspective of the project, aside from being fun for me, it actually cleans up a lot of stuff and makes a certain amount of things on the interior simpler and easier to work with. Another thing that I forgot to mention as we were going through this slide, there is a slide where I pointed out that we had unit tests running on the 4X branch. And I mentioned that that includes the first Golang tests that work at the level of the IR, the internal representation. Um, the way Emissary works is it reads in the input language, it does some processing to get it into an internal or intermediate representation, and then it translates the IR into the Envoy config. Um, that kind of pipeline, it, it, we're basically talking about a compiler. That kind of sort of pipeline makes it simpler in a lot of ways to reason about what's going on. Until very recently, there was no Go representation of the IR at all, which is a huge block in terms of trying to think about moving code out of Python into Go, which is a thing that would be really good to do. But now we have that. And so that unblocks some of that potential moving forward. Future stuff. Um, these are all short-term things that I really want to get done before London. Get the docs actually, you know, like get to the point where we have getambassador.io's docs redirect to emissary ingress.dev so that we can just go and rip it all out from getambassador.io, have it in one place, understand who's maintaining it, have it all working. That's, that's a very short-term goal. Uh, oh, whoops, I should not have done that. There we go. Ship an emissary 3.10.0. Um, 3.9.1 is the most recent emissary as opposed to ambassador edge stack that is really out there. There have been a lot of changes since then that went into main but have never been packaged into a release. So I want to fix that. I honestly don't really want to do any more 3.10s or 3. anything else ever again, but I really want to get a 3.10 out for those of people who are still on 3.9 and want stuff. Um, and of course, ship emissary 4, by which I mean get something out that people can work with and come back and either tell us how well it's working or complain. Um, I think I pretty much just covered this. Crap. Uh, yeah, the dock redirection thing is mostly just toil at this point. So if anybody loves to work on docs, let me know. Um, 3.10.0 RC0 is built, it works, it is still only AMD because the work that we've done to do multi-arch binaries is only in 4. I'm probably going to take a look at backporting that, but I'm kind of scared to. So if, it, if any of you out there are interested in taking a look at that, let me know, because that's what we really need with that is feedback. Um, also, 3.10.0 has a Helm chart for the CRDs as well, like Emissary 4 does, if that you know, makes it nicer for anybody to look at testing it. Um, emissary 4 is at a point where I, Alice and I have had some discussions about this. We were kind of hoping to not have to do this, but it looks like Emissary 4 is at a point where we need to go and rip out the conversion code that's still lingering around for dealing with v1, v2, et cetera, et cetera. And we have found a way in which that is badly getting in the way for the v4 alpha 1 CRDs, so that has to go. That's the next thing there. And I'm honestly pretty hopeful that after we do that, that we're in a place where we can start meaningfully testing emissary 4. So everybody cross your fingers on that one. And uh, more than anything else, Hey, dude, we need help. Everybody hears this about every project. Community projects do need a community behind them. There's a lot of work to be done. There are a few of us who are now able to do that work, which is great. We would love help if you can provide it. That would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. 
Um, while we're at it, I would kind of like a new logo for, new mascot logo for Emissary, if anybody is interested in that sort of thing. Um, and that's it. So, questions, comments, random. If you do have a question, please go to the mic for that one. Or maybe somebody can bring a mic to you. Will, uh, sorry, will edge tax still be basically ported from Emissary? Will it still be based on Emissary going forward? Do you know? Maybe I blew it out. Sorry. Hello? Ah, there we go, excellent. Okay, so the question was, um, paraphrased a bit more bluntly than the gentleman actually said, what's the deal with edge stack and what's going on with them? Um, all right, let me first state the obvious caveat. I am no longer an employee of Ambassador and have not been for the past couple of years. Nothing that I say should therefore be taken with anything other than a large number of grains of salt. But I have talked to the people working on Edge Stack quite a bit over the last little while. Um, Edge Stack 3, to the extent that they do new Edge Stacks that have a 3 as their major number, will still be based on Emissary. There seems to exist an internal Edge Stack thing based on Envoy Gateway that's completely different in every way and can only be configured using Gateway API. And I have no idea what's up with that beyond, I, I am given to understand that it may exist. Um, the second part of your question, I think, was whether any of the ambassador people are still active as emissary maintainers. Um, there is one I believe there's still one maintainer listed from Ambassador Labs. There are two, there's one maintainer from Ambassador Labs who uh, we're gonna go through and shift some people to Emeritus maintainer status. Uh, one of those is from Ambassador. There's one who I believe is still gonna be an active maintainer, uh, always assuming that we can really get them on board and, and get some assurances that they're gonna really be able to help with the community side, as opposed to not really being able to help. And so that's the remaining thing we kind of have to sort out with Ambassador of the company. I don't wanna yell again. I ask that because we know of at least one bug that when we switched back to Emissary from Edge Stack, it was, there's a bug in Emissary that they fixed in Edge Stack but did not backport it to Emissary. And I'm concerned that that kind yeah. of thing is happening. I want to hear exactly which bug that is, because this that may be one of the things that's fixed on main after 3.9. And I know of a couple of things like that, which is why I want to get a 3.10 out that has those fixes in it. Yeah. Hey, so um, I may be a little bit out of touch because we haven't um, been back to Emissary for uh, a little bit, but. Um, is there any support now for um, like native support for JWT tokens, um, unlike like going directly through Envoy? For Not yet. Envoy. PR is welcome. PR is welcome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Somewhat less facetiously, Envoy's native JWT stuff got added well after Emissary was around. Yeah. And. We kind of heard people on it. We heard a few people going like, "Oh, this would be kind of cool," but we never heard anybody really you know, beating on us and going, we have to have this. Um, so it was always, that's the only reason it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'd be, again, happy to talk to you about that afterwards as well. Okay. Yeah. There's, uh, there are a couple of things like that, like 
JWTs. Uh, Envoy has a native OAuth or OIDC filter. I forget which right now. Um, Xproc comes to mind. You know. Um, I can tell you that one of the reasons we never did OAuth OIDC natively with Envoy stuff was because EdgeDAC did that. And that's kind of less of a thing now. Anybody else? OK, so I had a bet with myself about whether anybody was going to ask me about Gateway API. And I actually lost that bet. I was sure somebody was going to bring it up. But uh, yeah, I'm always in a weird situation with Gateway API because I work with that group a lot. And at the same time, it's really tough for me to recommend it for the application developer. Um, but on the other hand, it is interesting. I was talking with some of the Envoy Gateway folks. Um, I have to go back and look at a couple of things. We may be at a point, we are certainly at a point where we could consider taking, you know, writing something that would take gateway API inputs and translate them into emissaries language. That's always been possible. It might be, there might be enough functionality in Envoy Gateway that we could consider that. I don't know, I have to look at it. Uh, for the moment, I personally am still not looking at bringing Gateway API as a first-class citizen to, into Emissary. And if anybody just really, really wants that, then again, we should talk about that. Other than that, uh, I'll be here at KubeCon a lot. I have a couple minutes after this that I can talk to people individually before going off and prepping for other stuff. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>